Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, uh, Amy Rose. Victoria Richardson. Oh, she's here. Yeah. She's online. Okay, I can't see her. She needs to. She's here. Can't see. Karen. Yep. Did you know that Victoria is here online? Uh, oh. Can't see her. She needs to go in as a as a. Moderator. Yeah, but do you have her? Um, do you have a setup there for her to be online? Yeah, on. Not, she, I can't. She's not visible to me right now. I've promoted her to panelist. No, can't see her. She, oh, yeah, she'll, she'll, she's there. I'm with her. I've got it. Thanks. Let's get started. Hey, I can see you. Okay, I think I've got the uh, the hand wave from Karen to start. Just let everybody shush for a second. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Digital Identity and Privacy, a Conflict of Interests. Um, I'd like to start with a welcome to country, if I may. Acknowledgements of country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, I'm very, very excited by the people that are uh, next to me right now, um, Amanda Robinson and uh, Bridget Engler, and also online, although I can't see behind me, but on the line we'll have Victoria uh, uh, from APN. There you go, waiting around. Excellent. Now, um, we're going to talk about a topic that has been my personal kind of passion project for about four years, so I'm going to try and not talk too much. Um, we're going to use the microphone as a talking stick because it's the only mic we have, it's all passed between each other to yeah, explain our interest. I'll do a very brief introduction. Uh, John Phillips, 460 degrees, and shortly to be with my good friend and colleague, Joe Spencer, uh, starting a company called Says Who, uh, which is a kind of weird and slang for Says Who, and you can find out about that in a few weeks' time. Um, but we're part of an expert management agency called 460. We have both been working on digital identity and trust, digital trust in particular, for a number of years now. And particularly around the thing called self-sovereign identity, which we can explain there if you're kind of interested. Um, but what I'm going to do now is pass the mic to my right and let each participant introduce themselves and why they're particularly interested personally and professionally in digital identity and privacy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Robinson. I'm Head of Social Innovation and Humanitech at Australian Red Cross. Um, I've been working in the identity space for a couple of years now with Red Cross exploring how we use verifiable credentials to enable greater humanitarian outcomes. Um, we see this as a, a great enabling infrastructure for uh, um, not only the humanitarian work that we do and enabling more humanitarian action, uh, but actually helping people who are experiencing vulnerability 
um, hence why privacy is such a, a key concern. I look forward to exploring a bit more of that as we go through the session. Hi, I'm Bridget and I'm a senior lecturer at Swinburne. So I teach in the business school uh, and the areas that I teach across are foresight, strategic design and innovation. Uh, and my interest is both as an individual, I can't understand why as a citizen you wouldn't be interested in this, uh, but also as a professional practitioner, as a foresight practitioner and as an educator, uh, this is something that we need to be thinking about. So that's my interest. Victoria, up in Sydney. Thank you, John. Victoria Richardson. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Australian Payments Network. So, so why is a, a, a payments industry body interested in identity? Well, one of the things that we did as a whole industry and through the Payments Council, which has telecommunications companies and payment schemes and banks and technology companies and the Australia Post, we said, as the future of payments unfolds, we think we probably need better trust mechanisms. And, um, you know, you, you see that now with um, post-COVID, there are many more payment scams, you know, with, with the shift to online, it's clear that we need better ways of building trust online. So we created a trust framework industry-wide and, um, and also did some early experimentation with Corda and, and um, verifiable credentials. So that's sort of the professional interest. I mean, personally, I. I think it's really curious that we don't have um, privacy enhancing ways of um, proving not necessarily who we are online, but you know, our, our right to something or, or make a claim. It, it's really interesting that we've sort of wholesale outsourced that to some of the big tech companies. And, um, and, and I think that matters. Thank you, John. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, and I, I want to sort of take the first question. For, we're going to go through a series of sort of uh, questions I've thought of before because I like those. Um, and then we'll hopefully have some time for the floor and others to, to give us their questions. Um, I want to go kind of along the line that Victoria was just describing. So are we solving for the wrong problem? So we've got the title deliberately kind of um, it, to be interpreted in a number of ways. Digital identity and privacy is the first part of our title. Uh, I would argue too many companies are far too focused on identifying us. And too often we build systems around the idea of identification of an individual before we decide what rights they have to things, what access they have, what abilities they have, what accounts they have access to, and so on. And what Victoria just made reference to was the idea of credentials. So the way that model works is that you're able to prove that you have the right to do something without necessarily saying who you are. Okay, so I can prove that I have a driving license without having to say who I am before I get the driving license over because it's not necessary to know who I am, it's just necessary to know I can drive a car. Uh, and it's that kind of thinking that I, that I would promote generally. So are we solving for the wrong problem? Are we too fixated on digital identity? The world is already overflowing with solutions for digital identity. Do we need yet more mice traps for this better way of catching mice? Thanks, John. We talk about at Red Cross identity equity uh, and how we are um, democratizing credentials to enable uh, identity equity. Um, we believe that identity and access to a recognizable identity is a fundamental human right. Um, and in fact, we have an obligation to ensure that these technologies are rolled out safe, safely and ensure um, individuals dignity. Um, and so with that in mind, I guess um, what we're really focusing on is how do we, through verifiable credentials, enable identity for everyone. Um, the UN Sustainable Development Goal um, says that uh, we want a legal identity for everybody in the planet by 2030. We're a long way from that. So, you know, what we need to do is start coming together as a community and really understanding what are the ecosystems, what is the infrastructure that we need to ensure that we develop an equitable and fair identity infrastructure and ecosystem. One of the challenges for me is that a lot of solutions are often solutions looking for a problem to solve in tech space. And, and I know that's a broad generalization, but it's intended as that. Um, but also a lot of the solutions, whether it's self-sovereign identity or uh, around you know, just identifying ourselves through a financial services process are grounded in business as usual. And that's a real problem because we're basing everything on current state. And when we research current state, we're only using historical data and our capacity to look forward into 
what might be the consequences, unintended or otherwise, of the decisions we make around that technology are not examined deeply enough, let alone further ahead enough. And we look at stuff two to five years out thinking, well, that's what's going to happen next. Or we listen to the tech pundits telling us what's going to be the next big thing in technology, and we accept that. And we don't question whether that's actually what we want to be, what we want to be using in 50 years' time. The long-term thinking is another particular favourite subject of yours, Bridget. Uh, Victoria, what do you think from a banking point of view? Are we too focused on identity in banking? So, so I don't think from a, a payments uh, banking perspective there's necessarily been too much focus on, on identity. I think that one of the challenges with digitising identity is that we've, we've done just that. So we've you know, if I think about my digital driver's license, it's actually just a digital version of my of my paper driver's license. And we haven't, but I don't mean this specific to banks, we haven't necessarily thought through um, the use case and what information needs to be presented to that use case. We've replicated something digitally that is being paper-based. And, but I think that that's probably a slightly older thing to say. I think we have moved on from that. If you look at some of the work that's happening around Open ID Connect and, and some of the um, identity assurance around that, I think there has been a shift. So, so I think previously, possibly there has been a, a focus too much on identity. I think we've moved on from that. And then certainly from a, um, a, a payments and banking perspective, there's a real focus on the need for, for privacy. So just by way of a really quick illustration, you know, when we put together the Trust ID framework, and you know, John, we've had conversations about that, you know, the intention is that it supports uh, multiple competing solutions. The intention is it would support a, a self-sovereign model. But even with the, the limited um, sort of framework we had at the time, privacy was front of mind. So one of the things that, um, a, a service provider wouldn't have to be a bank, but one of the things they could assert on your behalf is that you existed. So that's not, here's Victoria, here's when she was born, here's where she lived. It was okay, maybe for online surveys, the use case is that, you know, to get paid, the survey companies have to prove that they've spoken to real people. Um, and so, so that, was, that was one of the things, you could just get a ping and say, yes, that person exists. So yeah, just to recap, I think perhaps there has been some focus on the wrong thing. I think that's changing rapidly. I think there's a really increased understanding on the need for, for privacy. And, and we've got a lot of technology around at the moment that can help us deliver that. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, I think, you know, sitting as we are in, in Australia, one of the, the, uh, the other conversations we were having earlier was around um, recent, uh, I guess, government interest in a number of areas that we might consider being kind of privacy related, such as the uh, Access Act, Tola, and a few other sort of um, uh, recent uh, acts and, and bills that have been passed through. Um, often the argument presented is one of uh, uh, an argument says that there are bad things like money laundering, uh, uh, terrorism financing. Uh, of horrible crimes and therefore we need better kind of security access to people's private uh, worlds. Um, uh, how do we balance these interests? How do we balance the interest of what, what, what might be presented as, uh, uh, as the government's point of view, a reasonable requirement and our own interest perhaps in, in our privacy and our ability to act as uh, self-sovereign citizens? Thanks, John. Um, for me, it's really around context. And so in the situation of someone opening a bank account or um, uh, in the situation of money laundering, then maybe we need to know more than if someone is um, wanting to volunteer with a Red Cross, for instance. Um, and so it's really around context and, and what, what information is going to be important for the job to be done at that time. Um, with that, though, uh, particularly, again, for people who might be experiencing vulnerability, um, having to share data that um, is private can be very confronting um, and at worst, worst um, life uh, uh, limiting. Um, and so we need to really be really careful around the types of data that is um, stored or is uh, shared and put individuals absolutely in control of that data. Um, so really what we what we try to work towards is transparency 
um, control and choice. And so actually the individual gets to decide what information they share and with whom, um, as opposed to sort of thinking about privacy just for privacy's sake. It's really around choice and the context within which um, an individual is wanting to identify themselves. And that gets really hard when we're constantly asked to hand over information to be able to do the things that we want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Even buying something in a store, being asked for your email address means handing over information that you might not be willing to share. Um, so for me, this brings up questions around what value is identity and how is it valued? It seems to be commodified and, and constantly measured in dollar terms as opposed to something that's intrinsically connected to who we are as people and those futures that we will start to populate over the years to come. So the, 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 even the mantra around data is the new oil really scares me because we're attaching stuff to data that we don't necessarily trust to receive or give away. Uh, and I certainly question the validity of, of what we're gonna do with all of that data, how we store it. There are challenges around this stuff that are beyond just the, the management of identity and what it means to protect it for years to come. Victoria, do we put a price on identity, on, on the uh, personal information? Sorry, I had a problem with the, the mute button there. Um, do we put a price on identity? I think um, I, I wanted to build on some of the other comments made. I like the idea about transparency, control and choice. And, and in particular, in this market, the consumer data right aims to give us that. So I think that's a really important point to bear in mind when we're thinking about identity because the whole point of the consumer data right is that it has this concept of a data holder so that data holder might be your bank you know regulated entity um <clears throat> well whatever the emotional feeling is about banks they're heavily regulated and we trust them to look after our money i personally trust them to look after my data but it doesn't have to be a bank it's this concept of there are there are regulated entities that look after your data and then under your instruction and with your um, permission, we call it consent. I think consent's sometimes an unhelpfully passive word. You know, when we're giving consent, we're actually giving an instruction to our bank if we think about data sharing. But if we're giving an instruction to a bank or another data holder to share that information with, um, with a third party. So I really like that, that it's transparent, we've got control and we've got a choice. So I, and that sort of builds in with my um, last comment. I think possibly previously we thought about this in a narrow way. I think the regulatory construct in this market and the developments of Open ID Connect, which building an identity assurance precisely for um, AML reasons is really helpful. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, um, we could have very interesting conversations, I think, on the uh, consumer data right, which I, I kind of put into the blocking and sharing that perhaps it's a consumer data wrong, but by which I don't mean to be, I find, mean to be slightly sort of uh, uh, humorous, but the, 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 the act, I think, has genuine good intent um, uh, and tries to achieve an outcome which is better competition for financial services. So not the, the, if you want to uh, stereotype this, the big four uh, uh, commanding vast amounts of the market but allowing the fintechs to, to play as well and offer you great services. Um, and the argument is that to do that, they need to have access to the data about you which the banks hold. Um, so uh, the consumer data right is an act to try to allow or enforce the uh, right you have to share your data to others. And Joe Smith, my good colleague in the audience here, and I long discussed how that can work to your advantages and potentially your disadvantages because your data ends up in more, even more places than it was before. Uh, and you've got to kind of manage the consents that you've given to all sorts of parties and know where they are and all sorts of stuff. So it becomes a, a, a different kind of problem. Um, but that's a, perhaps a different conversation. I want to hand uh, a kind of question across the group, which is to do with um, uh, kind of creepy tech. So the, the idea that there's a, sort of two things you should ask about technology, you know, does it work? And the second question is, is it creepy? Um, and, and I think the, the question I'm thinking about here is that it's sort of smart cities. And I know that Bridget and her group in Swinburne are particularly good at smart cities. I think Amanda probably knows about that too. So smart cities often have this, um, this utopian ideal of, of, of technology being wonderfully accessible and reachable and doing all sorts of things for you. But there, there are the possibilities of dystopian future where we're just ants in the ants nest of, of the smart city and it's making all the decisions for us. So I, I guess I'm asking the question, 
how do we preserve our, our dignity and integrity or uh, our kind of mutual trust in a smart city? Do we have to be careful about the future, Amanda? Yes, we do. Um, I can't talk um, with any expertise around smart cities, but um, certainly the humanitarian perspective is do no harm um, and to always be planning for unintended consequences. So when we apply those principles to technologies, particularly when they're being rolled out at a faster and faster rate, um, then we need to really think about these technologies with a humanity first lens. Um, so how do we plan for those unintended consequences? Because we know they happen and we've seen them many, many times. Um, even in situations like the, the pandemic, when we are you know, all trying to get our lives back to normal as quickly as possible, um, but we need to make sure again that we're not creating a situation where we have that dystopia into the future um, and we are sort of further um, entrenching um, uh, disadvantage and, and marginalizing people. Um, so I'll leave it there and hand it to Bridget because I'm sure she'll have something more meaningful to say around smart cities. Oh, no, I'm feeling the pressure. Uh, smart cities are exciting and dynamic and have so much potential and they have so much potential to go really, really, really wrong. Um, surveillance capitalism is the term that comes to mind immediately. Um, and I find that frightening in so many ways, but I also find it um, a compromise that might be necessary in order for us to survive the next 50 to 150 years as people. Uh, so the, the thing for me is, again, the unintended consequences, but particularly taking the time to even consider them. Uh, Sidewalk Labs, which is probably the best known, um, is an example of, of people being the data in the computer that is the city. And cities are not computers. Uh, they're organic, they have sentient and non-sentient life forms in them. They have um, non-organic life forms that have a life of their own, like these buildings. And we need to remember that technology is an enabler. Uh, we can't deny our own autonomy and agency in a smart city. But equally, we have to be active in how those cities are shaped. And if, if data is useful, great. But it then takes me up another couple of levels to who decides what's useful or not. Who are the arbiters of this? Who takes who are the caretakers? And I'm much more interested in smart cities that support and enable stewardship through generations to come, as opposed to just this amazing tech enabled utopia for some, because my utopia might be your dystopia. Uh, but those tech enabled futures are not necessarily what we can deliver. And I'm talking about that at a practical level. Uh, we can't continue to build stuff that we cannot power that we cannot sustain and we cannot see surviving living with civilization through the next couple of hundred years that's the reality of it um there was suggestion about lithium shortage again recently so how are we going to support that if we have fully technologically enabled cities hi john um i i think that's uh sorry can you hear me you're looking so yes. okay sorry um, i I love that um, sentence, we have to take an active role in how it's shaped. And, and what's clear is that more will be automated. You know, we will have internet of things, we will have more connected devices, we will have decisions made by, um, by algorithms that were once made by people. You know, we have that anyway, there will be a proliferation of that. And, um, in, you know, you can, you can feel good about that, you can feel I'm disturbed about it, but it, it will happen. And I think it's really important that we, we do take an active role in how it's shaped. And what's very clear is that these things will need, uh, these entities will need identities. You know, we'll need to know uh, where it's located, who owns it, um, who do we call when it goes wrong, who's liable when it does something that we didn't expect it to do. And so I think it means that, um, you know, smart cities We'll, we'll need a much more sophisticated approach to digital identity and um, or, or trust. You know, I feel nervous about that word, digital identity, but we need we need a really holistic approach to how we create trust between people and things. And all of the frameworks that we talk about are all about you know consumers and businesses and government. And, and I think quite rapidly the smart cities will move us on to the point where we have to consciously include. Um, things, uh, non-sentient entities. Thank you. Thank you, Tora. Uh, we should ask one, one last question before we open up to the audience. And that, that, I think that question, given the, con the context of this discussion, should be um, what role does blockchain technologies have to play in digital identity and privacy? 
and um, I'll quickly voice my opinion here, which is that you kind of um, use them carefully and they can be brilliant, but don't, don't inadvisedly write personal identifiable information to an immutable ledger, for example, so that there are, there are ways to use this technology that are brilliant and ways to use it that are a little bit dumb. Um, and the unfortunate thing with a little bit dumb is it's dumb forever. Um, so we've kind of got to be careful. So I'm going to pass on to my colleagues to see what they think. Yeah, so uh, at Red Cross, we've developed a solution for verifiable credentials um, using blockchain. Um, and again, we step into that space very mindfully because as John said, once you write it to the ledger, it is immutable. Um, and again, for people who might be fleeing uh, conflict um, and who need to discard their identity quickly, um, we need for them to be able to do that. Um, at the same time, uh, a distributed ledger allows us to store information about people um, without having a central database, without risk of that data being attacked. Um, and so we can give people identities and not have them available for attack or, or um, misuse. Um, and so again, it's one of those, you know, conundrums as there's pros and there's cons, um, and I guess stepping into it very mindfully, understanding what those unintended uh, consequences or impacts might be down the track, uh, particularly again for people um, who are vulnerable. Um, but certainly, you know, piloting and testing and, and finding a path forward is absolutely essential if we're to understand these technologies. Yeah, I'd echo all of that. Uh, and I think it's exciting and it's also slightly terrifying for all of the reasons that have just been said. Uh, and then there's the challenge of maintaining it. Uh, there are two schools of thought that blockchain consumes an awful lot of energy that we could be putting into other things. I mean, actual power resources. Uh, but on the other hand, the existing financial systems in particular, which is where most of the criticism about blockchain's consumption of energy um, has been charged, is that, that they could, they're using power themselves. So we're simply using energy to support existing things. So the, I suppose the, it's ask a better question. And for me, a better question is, can we go into this more mindfully? Can people working in this space be charged with considering what that looks like 20 or 25 years from now, not just five or 10? And can we think about the generations to come? Can we consider what it's like for someone who hasn't been born to be coming into that world in 25 years from now? Or for someone who's being born now, what does that look like 25 years down the track? If we can consider those future generations, and I think this also brings us to connections around different ways of knowing, um, acknowledging that there are different ways of knowing around the world, different cultural dispositions to the way we understand, interpret, and manage and own identity, that uh, some of the kind of more material connections to identity are constructed within particular cultural paradigms. And we might need to explore beyond that as part of this exercise. So want to go down that rabbit hole about uh, identity and other cultures, but I'm going to pass on to Victoria and, and ask, uh, uh, what does the APN think of blockchain, Victoria? Um, so, uh, so I think the the question about you know why blockchain. My understanding is that the problem that blockchain solves is it it creates trust between parties that don't trust one another or don't need to trust one another. You know, it's an intermediary of trust, and and it's not obvious to me that in many of the use cases, there isn't a requirement for an intermediary and that that intermediary can hold that trust. And, and I think that, you know, you see that um, played out in the debate about central bank digital currency. China has a, um, a central bank digital currency that doesn't use a blockchain. And so if, if trust isn't your issue, so that if the intermediary of trust isn't your issue, um, you know, you could use a blockchain, but you could use other things. So I think that's, um, for me, that's the, the question, particularly with identity. Um, you know, usually you need intermediaries for other reasons, like managing the liability and the contractual um, rules around that and other business rules. So that, that's really my question is, you know, if, I think we probably need an intermediary. And if we do, then maybe, uh, blockchain isn't isn't the most obvious answer. Thank you. Um, now I know that we're running into a very tight schedule, so 
uh, we have coming up a presentation for about 15 minutes from Key, who's going to talk about some a very, very kind of private technology using blockchain for doing all sorts of really smart stuff. But uh, Karen, are there any questions that you want to lob to us at all from the, I noticed there's been messages flashing up on the phone in front of me. They're too far away for me to read. Um... Or anybody on the in the room with us want to ask a question in particular? Oh gosh, we've got hands up. Okay, three. I, I think you may be first, but your hand is still up. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about your um, question. Meta has been So the, just to, so that people can hear that the question was um, uh, the comment from Bridget around that we need cities to last the next five, fifty, in fact, you said two hundred years. And like a quick explanation. The short answer is I'll be gentle. Um, there are some ways of thinking that suggest we're on a pathway called civilizational decline or civilizational descent, that we are ine inevitably and irrevocably on that pathway um, to losing what we understand as civilization because of the decline, it, it, it hitting points of systemic collapse and not just in monetary, economic and social systems, but eco um, ecological systems. So there is a school of thought within the foresight world um, that we, we may be around for 150 years or so, a couple of hundred years. And so we need to think about that. And that we need to consider things like cathedral thinking. I know, I'm the bad news there. <laughs> um, we need to think about things like cathedral thinking as a principle um, and think about the legacy that we leave that could transcend that and allow us to come out of the side. So remember that hope over optimism every time. There's one question here. To what extent should a person's digital identity be controlled by them and them alone by a self-sovereign? I'll repeat it just in case it's not easy to hear. So to what extent should someone's identity be controlled by them and them alone? In other words, so they're coming from the self-sovereign entity uh, principles. Um, if I would answer that, the, the, the answer actually is somewhat paradoxical. Uh, yes, absolutely, you should manage those things that you have earned and gained or indeed that you can self-assert about yourself. Those are all your rights. Um, however, if you are trying to prove something to another individual or organization, you often need something that they know uh, about from another organization. In other words, if I say I have a degree from university, I need to prove that I have a degree from the university and they want to know which university and that university needs to assign something that I can pass on. So, so my ability to prove things to others often depends on other organizations and my prior relationships and the prior things I've gained. The, the act, the self-directed uh, act of being able to share them with whom I choose, when I choose and how much I choose, that's the bit that's self-sovereign. Uh, I'm able to do that when, whenever I want and how I want, and that should be my right. John, can I can I just build on that as well? I think some things that um, we want to assert ourselves about, we don't have complete ownership of them. So I I might lose my driving license and want to continue to say I've got a driver's license. So so there are they, sometimes there's dual dual ownership of that, and I think that's you know if you lose your passport then you can't use your passport and so there there is there is there are some dependencies there which mean that um self-sovereign is is embedded in sort of other systems and that's a, that's a good point victoria the, the idea would be you say that you the fact you have a driving license at a point in time you you earned the right to have a driving license and doesn't of course mean that you have that driving license in terms of the right to drive for life but the fact you had one at one point in time is a fact that you retain so mm. that you can revoke it but you still have it as a sort of an, an idea that you have it to issue to verify and check and see if it's revoked or not. Yeah. Uh, we'll take one more and then. Sorry, you've been, you've been asking for one. Go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Mm, my question is more perhaps of a comment. Um, I don't know if you agree with me that sometimes when we think uh, of identity in, in the blockchain space, we still think in, in, in legacy identities like our real names, our uh, real data, and that, that creates a vector of attack in, in, any, in any digital space. So these are interesting projects who, for example, talk about proof of humanity, where all you need is a seldom used identity linked to a proof of humanity. How feasible is that? 
And how are we ready to de nation five? Forgive me the, the horrible term, uh, our identities in, in the blockchain space so that uh, to make uh, them less vulnerable to attacks. Do you want me to try and ask that first? Okay, um, so so yeah, proof of humanity and the, and the whole idea of that, not kind of using your quotes, real identity for various things. Um, one of the cryptographic uh, constructs we can use is a zero knowledge proof um, idea, which would be the ability to assert something without having to give any of the data away about it. So in the, in the ideal world, you'd be able to prove I am human without having to give anything else away than the fact that somehow that I'm proving I'm human. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. We've got to be careful about Kind of giving away too much as Bridget was saying too much of our personal information all the time for no good reason it's an expectation and that's actually um if you're looking for positive signs some of the the reasoning behind uh the new south wales government doing service new south wales trying to reduce the amount of copies taken of driving licenses for no good reason uh, and leaving a legacy which left 54,000 people exposed in the dark web in terms of their digital driving license or well, their driving license details not at all um okay what well, one more question Do you want there's there's two well, there's probably a whole other conference about that but there's two the two questions i'm going to pass over to amanda about this but the the yes there's a project called id4d the world bank uh, had a project has a project called ID4D to, to try and bank the unbanked, and you can see that as a very positive action on their part. It's also related to the United Nations ID2020 project, one point something billion people don't have an identity in the world. Um, but the idea also, you're, you're echoing correctly about how do we make sure the right money gets to the right people. That's almost kind of another level of, of issue in terms of how, how you make that, that transaction. And one of the other talks earlier this week has been around the use of cryptocurrencies and uh, mechanisms to transfer funds the needy without them getting kind of diluted and misdirected. I'm going to pass it to Amanda. Thanks, John. Um, yes, yeah, so that's something that we're looking at um, uh, in terms of a couple of things. One is um, banking now banked, or at least getting uh, people access to cash when they need it, um, whether that be again in times of emergencies or disasters, um, or, or because there's no way of having that they currently don't have a legal identity. Um, another way of thinking about it is actually unbanking the bank. And so how do we actually think about a more equitable system for all of us um, so that we're not having to bring people into current infrastructures, but actually unpacking and dismantling um, what we have already. I can see Bridget not his <laughs> own. That just gets me really excited because it's the potential to shape a different future. The future is not a given. It's not something that exists in a particular space or point in time, and we can change it and we can have a future that we prefer. But some of the things that um, up, we're up against are the, the pace of change. And I'm not talking about technology change, but the different paces and change around infrastructure, um, the technology itself, things like law, um, culture, they all work at different paces and therefore we need to find a way of lining stuff up so that we can start to reinvent those systems and practices that we've held on to for the last few hundred years of industrialization. And I'll just quickly say to the point about identity and our Western notions of identity, I think that also plays into that conversation and we absolutely need to be thinking about how we frame identity and um, stepping away from those Western notions and thinking about other ways of identifying ourselves, which are a multiple. We've got to let Victoria talk because she's part of the Australian Payments Directive. It's about banking. I, I think it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting concept, uh, unbanking the banked. And um, uh, we, we probably have different views about the consumer data, right, John? But, I do think that it will give people more control, more options, more choice, more input for information. And so I think people will end up making different choices. You know, it's going to take time, but they'll end up making different and more informed choices based on a better understanding of the options before them. And then there will be more choices for them to make because uh, other organisations will um, have, have the power of the data that has, to, to some extent, been concentrated in some large entities. 
so I, I like the concept and I, um, I look forward to hearing more about it. I'm going to have to draw the conversation to a close because I need to give time enough for Key to present his, his stuff. Uh, you can tell we're all very passionate about the subject and there's a lifetime of talking about it probably. But we're going to be around, I think, for a while after the, 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 this sort of webcast part is over. So if, if the people are here want to talk, if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn or something, then you're very welcome to do so. Uh, we're probably using pseudo anonymous IDs in LinkedIn, but you know, just what the heck, uh, connect to us. Um, so I think Key, if you're ready, you can come up. I guess we can probably exit stage right because it's got steps we're just getting the slides up but that point about uh unbanking the banks is very interesting and i think actually something that is occurring very quickly with interest rates going as low as they are in the traditional banking world and DeFi offering massive interest rates like people are naturally moving to DeFi protocols um i know i i have very little money in the bank account these days and it's in you know compound and Aave and other protocols that are on ethereum that give you know significant interest rates so yeah great i think we're on that's the first slide here we go next <laughs> I may need to. That's where I was. Yeah, got it. All right. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the CTO of Oxen. So, Oxen is a cryptocurrency um, company. We build a couple of applications, though. So, we work on um, Session, which is a messaging application. And we also work on LokiNet, which is an onion router, um, similar to Tor, if people have used that before. Um, yep, yeah, so that's that's a little, little, little bit about me. And we were formerly Loki. People might know us under that name as well. So, very nice. uh, so what is Session? And I'll be talking about Session mostly today because I think it relates more to this identity um space than the blockchain aspect does although i could probably talk about uh, blockchain identity for a while as well um so it's a fork of signal um which is another popular messaging application which has been getting a lot of interest over the last couple of months um especially with uh, whatsapp changing their privacy policy recently a lot of people have been moving over to signal um it's got about 100,000 monthly active users right now which is pretty small compared to some of the bigger messaging applications but it's something that we're really building on and um we're growing as well which is good to see. um it's a decentralized storage network so it doesn't have any central servers um open source hunting around it and get encrypted and there's no fun phone numbers so i'll kind of explain that because there's a lot of buzzwords and you know kind of go into them and we'll work out what we're actually doing so we'll go to the next slide can you just no one can see you so at the moment that's you're fine. either on the slide or that's the slides are fine okay we'll get that working. great so in terms of identifiers that we tend to use in messaging applications the top three tend to be usernames email addresses and phone numbers um usually when we sign up for a messaging application where we're talking about um you know needing to provide one of these three and the, the thing is about those identifiers is they're not just linked to, um, well, they're not, they're not, they're linked to everything in our life. Our email address is used to register for hundreds of different services usually. We tend to use the same usernames over five, 10, 20 different services. Um, and our phone numbers are linked to ourselves, uh, not just through the fact that most people need to use uh, um, driver's license to sign up to get a phone number these days um, but also you'll register that on your whatsapp you'll register that to your business you register that you'll just give that out to a lot of people and you know i did it when i walked into the room here i gave my mobile phone number um, through a contact tracing app so you've got so many different links to these different pieces of information uh, and then you're using them to sign up to a messaging application where potentially we could be sending extremely sensitive data um, so it, it really kind of fades the anonymity that you have on some of these services. Um, in terms of like the, the services that you can use to resolve phone numbers and IP addresses and um, email addresses, 
into usable data about people. So a tool that um, you can use is a link up there, OSIN framework. So basically, if you go on the website, it will go through a bunch of um, different ways to resolve an email address into maybe they use this email address through multiple accounts. They might have used it on Facebook. They might have used it on Google. They might have a forum sign up with that email address. So you can often form a really good picture about someone just through some of these identifiers. Um, maybe we'll go next slide. So what is the approach in session? What do we do to kind of disconnect people from um, using these kind of identifiers that they use in everyday life? Um, we take an approach similar to Bitcoin. If you've ever had a Bitcoin wallet, you just generate a public private key pair. So that really long Bitcoin address that you would have received Bitcoin or that really long Ethereum address that you would have received Ethereum to, we do a very similar thing, except in the context of messaging. So instead of receiving money there, we receive messages there. Um, and this is completely unconnected to any other physical, um, you know, kind of phone number, email address um, that you would typically have. It's just randomly generated on the fly. Um, so maybe we'll go next slide. Aaron. So what's the approach with IP addresses? Um, typically when you have a messaging application, you'll have a server that stores all of the messages and you'll send your message to the server and then um, the recipient of the message requests the message from the server. The problem there is each of the um, people communicating with that server has a unique identifier called an IP address. Um, and if you're a government or an ISP and even a regular person, you can resolve these IP addresses to course location, or you can find out the specific person who's using that IP address. So what we tend to want to do with session is to use a, an approach called onion routing, which basically bounces your connection um, to the server in this case. And there isn't really a server in session, either it's a centralized network, um, but it, it routes your connection to that end destination where a message is stored through three different hops. So the first hop does know your IP address, but it doesn't know the person you're sending your message to. Um, the second hop knows there's two, um, two kind of servers in this decentralized network, but doesn't know who sent it and what the destination is. And the last hop knows the destination. So we kind of split up the data that you would traditionally have going to one server to three different servers. So unless there's collaboration between those servers, you get anonymity where no party actually knows um, the person who's sending IP address and the person who's receiving IP, IP address. Um, so that's the approach we use there. And contents and social graphs. So this is um, stuff like, okay, you message this person at this particular time. This is something that's really hard to deal with if you're constantly messaging someone at a particular time or you have a group of friends that you message regularly. This is something that we're working on in session. It's a very tricky problem to solve. Um, but the easier the easier thing is the contents of the message. So you can end-to-end -end encrypt the message so that the server can't read the contents of the message. You can only have the um, user who sends the message and the user who receives the message can, can read the message essentially. So the end, the end result of this is that you should have anonymous registration. So there is no um, email address or phone number or anything like that required to register. Um, the graph between the sender and the receiver should be entirely obfuscated in terms of the IP addresses that are sending. Um, and there also you want to remove IP address information as well. Um, so that's kind of what session achieves um, with these techniques. So it's, it's maybe interesting to explore like the justification for why you would want to do this, um, which gets a bit more into the philosophy of it. Um, in terms of like this, I think everyone can can feel this, but the surveillance state is growing. Like you, when you use the internet, it's not like using the internet ten years ago. You feel as if you are constantly tracked. You feel as if advertisement is targeted towards you, and is, and that targeting is getting more and more accurate. Um, and and there's more points of where we need to identify ourselves to be able to use the services that we want to every day, and messaging is a very essential service it's in in the internet it's akin to being able to talk to someone that is such a basic essential right in our day-to-day -day lives we would never accept someone standing there and listening to our conversations but somehow when we go to the context of the internet 
we're okay with letting other people read our messages when we talk to people. Um, so that, that's kind of some of the philosophy. I mean, business models are obviously tending towards advertisement. And I think another thing is like it creates, having anonymity in some of these systems creates spaces for people to talk about things that they might not understand fully themselves. For example, someone exploring their sexual identity, they might not want that connected to their physical self. They might not be comfortable with that aspect of themselves or still be exploring it. Having something where, or having a system where you can have anonymity in messaging and have groups that explore um, those aspects of personality together without it being intrinsically linked to their physical identity is really powerful um, tool to, to create. I mean, there's counterpoints to this as well. Um, anonymity can change how people are. Like um, often people will behave in different ways when they know that they're anonymous and things can't be traced back to them. And often in worse ways, uh, frankly. And the other point is by limiting the amount of data we have access to, we don't have any ability to censor what goes on on session, which can be scary because people could be distributing copyrighted um, content, for example, on the platform, we would have no idea that they were doing this and no ability to stop them, um, which is different from the kind of traditional model of running a service where everything runs through the service provider and they have a limited degree of um, control over what goes on. Um, in terms of like the challenges that we're facing, I think it's important to kind of go through these because um, the more we kind of expose challenges to people, the more ideas we come up with to solve them. Um, there's something, uh, well, I mean, proof of humanness is something that was talked about before. Session doesn't really care about who you are. Um, in fact, we don't want to know who you are at all. That would ruin the anonymity. But we do care if you're a computer or a human. Um, so there's some interesting ways that we're looking at right now to prove that someone is a human or you know, that they can solve um, challenges that humans tend to be good at solving over um, challenges that, that machines tend to be better at solving. Um, so I'll show you an example of that next. But the other one is, oh, let's just go back. Yeah, um, Zuko's triangle. So um, for example, like, I think I had a picture up there of what a session ID looked like. It's all this um, you know, weird kind of string you know, that is not human meaningful. So we tend, and Zuko's triangle is basically that you can have two of these things when named. So you can be human meaningful or decentralized, decentralized or secure, or secure and human meaningful. Session is definitely on the decentralized and secure aspect of things, um, but it doesn't have any human mean, uh, like meaning to the name. It's impossible to memorize that string of um, characters. There's some uh, interesting projects going on right now um, with Ethereum, with uh, ENS out of it, which basically allows you to map an Ethereum address to a human readable name on the blockchain. Um, so we're thinking of deploying something um, similar to that on the Oxen blockchain. So we'll go next. Um, so the, these are some interesting projects. Um, Idena is doing uh, this thing called a decentralized um, humanness proof. And if you go next, I can um, show you. So if you can see the pictures up here, basically the way that their proof of humanness works is that there's two um, keywords, which both of the stories and each of these timelines is basically like a story here. Um, so you need to, the story has to include those two, two, two keywords, but it needs to also be chronological. So you have, for example, I, I think the story that's trying to be told here is that there's a drug smuggler and at the end he gets caught by the police. This, if for, for, if for a computer to recognize and create this story is extremely difficult from just those two keywords and to create it in chronological order. So what happens is the human will generate both the first, the first strip, which is the story in order, and the second strip, which is the story out of order. Um, and it's up, it's up to other humans to work out which story is correct. So it's both the production that is difficult for computers and also um, the identification of which story is in chronological order. And the combination of the two of these things is able to produce a, a pretty um, interesting proof of humanness, which is beyond um, capture technology that we have currently. Um, so we'll go next slide. 
I think I think that's basically it. Um, thanks everyone for listening, and, and thanks to the panelists for us. That was brilliant, Keith. Thank you. Stay, stay. Um, yeah, I was just going to, we're going to close, but um, I just think you're going to have a fantastically interesting time with the uh, Australian Action Access and Accountability. Yeah, cool. Um, oh, um, but uh, any questions quickly to Key? Anything that we want to ask from the audience? Can we get everybody back up? Is that yeah, right? please. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Bridget, uh, and then uh, I don't know if Victoria is still able to listen. So I think it's such a, a great topic. So happy to open up the room to more questions uh, to Key or to the rest of the panelists. Dex. Um, so one step is equal to all those conditions are equal to three. So this product, I mean, it's an amazing product. I'd love to get on it. But how do you commercialize it? Do you charge the customers to use it? So we, we don't charge anyone for the base um, kind of use case of it, but there are premium features. For example, um, what I talked about before, where you could um, like typically you have a session ID, which is a random um, string of characters. But if you wanted to map that to a readable name, you know, like say I wanted my name in session to be P, that requires a blockchain transaction, which I think costs five dollars or something like that so there there's all and and the, this is just one example of one of the things that we can monetize we can also monetize creating larger groups on the on the application um but the idea is that always at the core of the application it should be free um because otherwise you're not going to be able to compete with other messaging applications and also like the people we're targeting um like the people this is most useful for are like kind of human rights activists journalists and these people are not you know bankrolled you know, individuals. So it, it, it's good to provide that service for free, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any others? Go. Uh, I want to ask about digital democracy and voting and how it effectively proves that cryptocurrencies are still not. I think can one, you, either Amanda or, or Bridget, you were talking about that in the conversation. Sorry, John, can you just repeat that? Oh, sorry, repeat the question. The question uh, I'll have to paraphrase, I think, if that's okay. Um, it's it's basically about how do we how can we use uh, a kind of digital construct to enable voting that uh, is both uh, uh, private and secure, so we don't get the accusations of, of fake votes and whatever else, but we don't get people being kind of uh, um, victimized because of the way they have voted. So how do, how do we achieve that in a democracy? I haven't spent a lot of time in that space other than to say absolutely. Um, and it's something that is a, a fantastic use case to explore again, particularly um, if for, for countries where um, when you're voting, um, sometimes that can have dire consequences. Um, and so how do we do it in a way that is safe and secure, but enables people to fully participate? Um, and so I, I can't elaborate much more than that. Bridget, did you have any? The only thing I'd add is governance around that, and not just in, our, in, the, in the notion of the digital democracy, but what are the governance systems around that? You know, is democracy what we want? Is demo and who is the we when we decide that? So when we talk about digital democracy, what does that represent in terms of the culture and the communities that are participating in that? So this push towards participatory democracy and participatory governance might be an interesting play into being able to, to, to trust the communication that goes with that. And I'll just finish with a, a slightly poorly remembered reference. There was a, a project initiative in, based from Australia that called Horizon, which was looking at yeah, Horizon, looking at how it might enable uh, kind of an e-voting construct in a safe, secure way. And at the time I last spoke, and they were even apparently being approached by the Indonesian government as a, as a possible platform to be used for large-scale voting processes. They went one step further. So not just about an anonymity and one vote and only one vote and that kind of thing. They actually were trying to create a platform that enable people to have uh, kind of equal access to information, uh, which I think is a really challenging problem to, to try to solve 
um, even beyond uh, digital identity and privacy. One last question, maybe. Thank you. So, um, there's a lot of speculation around uh, sharing the past, um, the love of the department, the GDPR, that has very little respect that we would have had to buy the law and the process across the very large and very refined organization. Frequently, uh, we'll be mentioned during this bit of compromise and a few. Uh, I think we might have to look outside of Australia probably for some of the initiatives. So, so there's the there's a Californian Act uh, that was passed, I think, uh, 18 months ago or so, uh, that provides some of the same sort of uh, protections that GDPR provides. Um, and there are other initiatives, uh, uh, countries like New Zealand are looking at various protections for New Zealand citizens. We seem to be kind of heading in the other direction at the moment in, in Australia, and so we're providing yet more access to people's data. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's coming. I think we had a reference in one of the, uh, either, either Bridget or Amanda referenced uh, surveillance capitalism, which is Shoshana Zuboff's book. Uh, and that kind of gives you a sense of what's likely to happen to organizations that misuse our data. There's probably going to be a bit of a backlash, to say the least, around organizations that are making a misuse of it. So I think it's becoming a bit like investing, uh, so I'm going politically incorrect or correct perhaps, um, investing in industries that cause damage to the environment is no longer a financially good idea. You know? So now the banks stop investing in things that others might have once called green. They no they're not longer want to invest in things that cause damage to the environment. So I think if you start causing damage to people's data and misusing it, it's going to be a negative. Uh, and, and go, go regardless of regulations, it's going to be financially stupid. I think maybe it's the wrong approach to look at this only through a legislative lens as well, because we've kind of seen what's happened with GDPR. Like, we now all have a cookie thing, like, do you want these cookies on your website, right? And that's compliant. But that doesn't really change how people use the internet. We all just click accept because we want to use the website, right? So looking, you know, it has to be a multifaceted approach. We have to look at this through changing user behavior as well, which is probably the much harder thing to do than just to pass a law. Um, but you, you see what happens when you just pass a law. Often the user behavior just is, okay, we'll click another button. And it's, yeah, nothing changed. To add to that, I think um, convenience is always the de death of uh, security and privacy. Um, and we all prioritize convenience over privacy every day. And until we start to prioritize our own um, and keeping that safe and being in control of it, then we're probably just going to continue to see the same paradigm. Um, so I agree with Key. I think we, we need to sort of shift our mental models around data and privacy and, and ownership of that data. Um, and to go back to John's opening point around owning our own data and self-sovereign identity and, and um, taking control back. Sorry, I'm gonna add to that as well. The other challenge is at a global level, because there are conflicts. If you're an international organization and you've got one set of rules and reg regulatory requirements for a group of people that do not apply to others, you have inconsistent processes, you have inconsistency in systems, you have challenges around communication and you have breakdown in the organization. So at a very simple level, if you are an NGO trying to do stuff for your members around the world, it's a bit stuck. Uh, and it, in, in, in the name of protecting people's privacy or respecting that they want to own their data. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we have to look at this from a macro level, not just, oh, well, this is important to us. Because I have a bank account in the UK, and I don't know how many times I had to hit that damn button to be able to accept stuff because my account was required to do that because in Australia it meant nothing to me because I use a VPN, I didn't know I was here. It makes me think of one of those phrases that says, for every complex problem, there is a, an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. That's what we have with our next one. We have any time for one last question, then what would we hang around with? We're going to actually just um, log off, so, um, but we can stay in the room here. So, um, before we log off,
Thank you to everyone for coming tonight and online. Uh, and Blockchain Week will continue online tomorrow, Thursday. Yes, we are killing ourselves here, day four. So um, blockchain, 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 blockchain. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists online, uh, for all of our viewers, and also uh, blockchainweek.com.au tomorrow for online events, and to YBF Ventures for hosting us here in person, and to Block 8 and to our brand, our sponsors.